Welcome to the Harper's Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Luca. It's easy to romanticize journalism's past, and many do, with alarming frequency, even though there was never a time when some mythic we were all on the same page and shared the same reality. Still, the decline of robust local news outlets in the United States has led to a situation in which small-town politics, just as easily drift toward existential conflict, transformed into something more digestible and pleasing to the algorithm. At least that's one way to describe what's happening in Redding, California, where, as James Pogue reports in the April issue of Harper's Magazine, a city council race recently became the focal point of a militia-backed secessionist movement whose members say they're willing to sacrifice everything to defend a threatened, rural way of life. I talked to Pogue, now living in Redding himself, about what that lifestyle is, the risks this movement reveals in American democracy, and his concerns for the coming summer. This is far from the first time you've investigated and spent a substantial amount of time with a rural, militia-backed, primarily white anti-government movement in the United States. You know, you're more easily able to connect with Woody Clendenin, the, the barber and sort of like de facto leader of this militia, because you were embedded with Eamon Bundy during the 2016 standoff at the National Wildlife Refuge in Oregon. And it'd be interesting to hear how the Jefferson Society secessionist movement compares with others you've spent time in and how you might describe the through line, if there is one. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, you've just asked me a question that I've spent a lifetime trying to figure out. Um, <laughs> the first thing I would say, though, is that what surprised me reporting this and, you know, like, reporting on militias is, is this funny thing where you can do it in a way where everything that you thought about them gets confirmed. You can find all that stuff. They're evil, they're anti-government, all of that. And there's a lot of reporting that reflects that. And I'm not trying to push back on that in any way with these guys, but there's also something about militias where I consistently find that every time you report on a movement, you get surprised. There's something different. There's something that the usual narrative didn't include. And so... The state of Jefferson is interesting as a sort of region of California that has a formed political identity around being rural in a way that even, you know, Montana doesn't necessarily, right? And that worldview, it turns out, fits really well into this kind of broader, you could even argue younger right-wing thing that is happening that's sort of more like the anti-globalist thing mm. because you have up here... And I don't want to overstate this, but you have up here a lot of people who are moving from the Bay. I mean, it's the basic kind of coloring characteristic of the town that I'm talking to you from, which is Dunsmere, California, is that there's a lot of second homers and people buying up things to rent out on an Airbnb and building condos. And you hear a lot of people talking about, you know, what do they call it? They call the condos, pack them and stack them, you know, and it's this <laughs> way of life we don't want to live. And it fits really easily into this kind of anti-globalist narrative, this idea, you know, that we're all going to be rendered into bug eating, pod dwelling, Netflix watching sort of drone people. And that was something that I personally did not expect to find up here at all. That was a conversation that I thought was reserved for like, you know, young right wing sort of activist -y types in DC who work for magazines with the names of like American in the title. Mm -hmm. And so what I think that this showed me in a way is that sort of rural militia politics is suddenly becoming very intertwined with kind of proud boy politics becoming very intertwined with sort of more traditional Trumpian stuff in a way that Ammon Bundy was not at all. Yeah. I mean, Ammon Bundy was kind of like a pioneer. <laughs> he was yeah, kind of, exactly. he kind of, he kind of blew the whole thing open for everybody else, <laughs> but That's you could exactly probably see right. more. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, with regard to Ammon Bundy, who's probably interesting to talk about here just because he's the militia Western guy that everyone knows, you know, Ammon held himself very separate from the kind of like broader right wing ferment. Ammon was very much a kind of, I'm a rancher, I do rancher things. And he was mm -hmm. Mormon and he had a very Mormon shaped worldview. The state of Jefferson has this very idiosyncratic rural history 
shaped, you know, by a history of logging, by a history of mining, and by a kind of like sense of separateness from California. But that has started to fit into a broader kind of rural politics where most rural areas in America now hold themselves somewhat separate from the worldview that has come to predominate in America's urban centers. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, throughout the piece, I was reminded of Puerto Rico, which has, you know, had several referendums for statehood. And, you know, Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory with three million people that nobody outside of Puerto Rico really realizes is part of the United States and it's exploited and it's ignored. And, you know, this sort of like basic aid cannot get there. There are a lot of things that the people in, you know, you write about Jefferson. It's a, it's a region that has long been neglected by distant metropolitan nodes of power. And that's very true of Puerto Rico as well. But they're also sort of seeking statehood. But when people talk about statehood for Puerto Rico, they're not thinking of other parts of the country that feel similarly underrepresented or perhaps misrepresented by their, you know, the people who are in the, their state capitals, let's say. Indeed. And, you know, I mean, I think it's kind of one of the great tragedies of American politics that like every kind of movement of the disaffected has a political valence that makes it to the other side seem really evil, right? And that's not to say that anyone who comes from a liberal side of things would like anything that the state of Jefferson types are saying. But there is a kind of basic problem here where like they are somewhat underrepresented in terms of the broader Californian worldview and political system. And this does create a sense of rage and alienation that then does cause our politics to go slightly insane, right? And Puerto Rico, you know, that movement historically had a left-wing political valence, but yeah, I mean, I do think in certain ways they're coming from the same place and that they're, it would be interesting to pose to people in the state of Jefferson that concept of colony, but it very much is, and I don't say this, you know, I don't say this to justify the secessionist movement, but it very much does have a structure of a resource colony. It's a place where right. people come either to take resources out of it or to vacation. Right. <laughs> and in, in that regard, it is sort of this Californian, like Northern colony. Right. Because whenever there's an election, when the election goes badly for, let's say, Democrats, you know, there's always inevitably some op-ed or several op-eds or a flood of op-eds talking about like, well, why doesn't the South just secede? But it seems like when people actually talk about seceding in a meaningful way or sort of redefining themselves, it's it's presented as this very scary thing. And I'm not saying that a town where there's not, you know, not that normal police, whatever, I won't get into that, but that there's sort of like these armed militias coming around and there's a lot of talk about like, we need to take this with a fight and not with voting. It gets a little scary. So I guess thinking about those issues of like redividing the country, I mean, it seems to me that it's coming to a point where you can't actually divide the country in a meaningful way, that there are just kind of like these, these irreparable these things that just cannot be contained within the, the boundaries of a state or perhaps even at a federal level. Yes. And I think this presents a real problem for our politics. And so one of the things that I, again, like I hadn't really thought about until I started reporting this piece. And it's a kind of interesting thought experiment because you have this militia and there are as, as mentioned, there's a lot of death threats that rose up around specifically beginning with the COVID stuff, where the people involved felt like, you know, whatever percentage of the county, and it's tough to pull a rural county where a lot of people don't have phones, a lot of people aren't reachable. So I'm not even going to hazard a guess precisely about how many people were dead, dead, dead set against the mask mandates and dead, dead set against California's COVID protocols. But it was a very sizable percentage. And that percentage of people was not responding to the fact that they had to wear a mask in Walmart because they didn't. No one here ever had to wear a mask in Walmart. It just didn't happen. What they were responding to was a sense that this was the beginning of an authoritarian takeover by, you know, a, a liberal elite in urban centers, right? Mm -hmm. And that they expected their county government to make, you know, as they say out here in the West, a hard stand, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem that you get there is that 
you had all of these people, some, many of whom, you know, my neighbor, who's a little bit probably on the side of these guys in certain ways, but my neighbor, you know, drives home the point all the time to me, you know, that there are racists involved in this. There are white mm -hmm. supremacists involved in this. And there are also like kooks and wing nuts, right? So there are these people who, who, who legitimate, legitimately just are like lost, lonely, really, really angry people who send death threats and get on Facebook and do really crazy stuff and barrage and berate, you know, they're basically decent hearted, you know, county supervisors and stuff. That stuff's all real. But then the question that you have is if there is this worldview in the county that's shared by at least a sizable proportion of it, maybe half, maybe more, of people who really thought that this was a kind of sole issue for their representatives to take a stand on and that they expected their representatives to do so. And then they launch an election in a democratic system, <laughs> they organize and win an election. And the response in both the sort of the broader state media in California, statewide media in California, I'm not suggesting California has a state media, but in the broader statewide media of California and amongst the county's liberals was that this recall was itself an extremist and illegitimate project. Then you have a real problem with democracy because actually this, you're basically saying to these militia people, hey, you shouldn't have done this election. So then what are they gonna do? And right. I don't have a good answer for that. I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not on the side of these recall guys, but I'm also questioning what the path forward for politics can be if the response of the liberal side of it was to say that the recall was illegitimate and terrorist inflected and should never have happened, right? And so you get into a, sorry, I'm talking so much, but this, this was kind of the thing that really kind of shook my vision of politics up here was that question of how a group of people who doesn't share a view of how democracy should work with their liberal neighbors, how we can get back to a point where the county can be effectively governed. And I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, I think that is the question. You know, this piece is slugged uh, letter from Shasta County, which of course reminds me of Mount Shasta, which is like this hotbed of new age beliefs since, you know, with like the ascended masters, the Lemurians, all this stuff. And, Manchesta is famous for being the site of where cognitive distance theory was first noted because these two college professors infiltrated this cult that believed the world was going to end on a very specific date. And then when the world didn't end, the cult members just doubled down on their beliefs. And of course, it's easy to see how this phenomenon applies to other types of belief. I don't know, say politics. So I guess to what extent did the failure, I mean, again, you you came here sort of during the pandemic. You weren't here before, but I mean, do you feel like the tension between these groups was sort of exacerbated by the the failure of Trump to kind of bring the change that he promised he would or or alluded to or sort of vaguely, you know, the way he speaks, it's like, well, whatever, whatever you say. He didn't the failure of Trump, did that did that sort of escalate things? That's that's a fascinating question. And I would say yes. And this, you, you kind of hit on precisely how this gets into the broader, I think, national political ferment. Because, you know, I well, first of all, I was, I've been coming to report on the state of Jefferson ever since, I mean, since during the Obama administration, actually, I came, there was a standoff in Southern Oregon at a gold mine. And that was kind of early days of the Oath Keeper organization, which now, of course, is, you know, a lot of people know is being involved in the Capitol attack. And Stuart Rhodes, who was prosecuted for that, I think showed up at that standoff, stuff like that. So this has been kind of bubbling up here, fed in a lot of ways by anger over forestry policy, which we may get into as well. But then you get this kind of thing that still existed in 2018. I came to cover the car fire in Reading which killed a lot of people and really, really was kind of a devastating sort of all county event that mm -hmm. shook people in really serious ways and also brought them together. So Reading in 2018 during that summer was a really shaken, dark place, but it was a place where people had really pulled together and kind of viewed themselves as neighbors surviving an elemental <laughs> challenge. And 
coming back over the course of the next couple of years, it was absolutely shocking to see how quickly that went away. And a lot of people brought that up to me, seeing the difference between the car fire and the pandemic. And the reason I think that the Trump thing is, is really key and really interesting is that over the course of that time, conservatives were seeing from what they would regard as, you know, kind of the liberal urban establishment and, you know, the, the New York Times and, you know, all these guys who now, you know, conservatives, you know, conservatives in rural areas weren't reading people like Curtis Yarvin and, <laughs> you, know, you know, stuff like this. They, they weren't reading that kind of a media analysis. They weren't seeing it, but Russia Gate. Russia Gate really brought that home to them because they thought, oh, you know what? They're just going to do anything they can to destroy this guy and prevent his agenda from going through, even if it right. involves like a concerted media attack and, you know, not to go into Russia Gate, but, you know, something that conservatives at least viewed as more or less entirely ginned up by the Clinton campaign and their collaborators in the media, right? Yeah. So what you see here, I think during COVID was, a lot of people took that analysis and applied it to their own government where they were mm -hmm. like, oh, we just don't care what the newspaper says about us anymore. We don't care what the government says about us anymore. They're going to say that we're evil no matter what we do. And so we're just going to do whatever we want. And here is a great example of the sort of decline in trust in our media and also the decline of the media itself has had a really deleterious effect because there is no kind of baseline newspaper here that could advance a shared worldview in the morning. Like no one's getting that. They're getting stuff from Facebook. And something that, I, you know, I, I'm going to, I think, do a book about this place going forward. And something that I'm going to really drill down on is that just like in a world where the loudest voices are just amplified on Facebook and here, because it's rural Facebook, mm -hmm. but in other places where it's Twitter, these politics just can't work. Like you can't have right. people with just who, who get validated by advancing two diametrically opposed worldviews as loudly as possible. And to elevate figures who do that. And then each of those becomes competing poles who are like more or less artificially supported by the structural virality of the platforms that they're using. By right? an algorithm, which is not- yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so it's doing really, really terrible things to our country. And we all realize that, but this is like a great example of how it's doing something really ter terrible and dangerous just to one place. And it's a really great lens for that, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it is interesting, but again, speaks to this, this vacuum left by the death of local news that, you know, even though all of these people really hate the Bay Area, they hate the tech lords, they hate Mark Zuckerberg, they're still reliant on this totally for for just sort of a basic semblance of like news gathering, sort of like what's going on in the community, like all of these things that, you know, again, it's it seems that because sort of like the normal structures of democracy, the traditional structures of democracy have been hollowed out. Right. And this works in this works in both ways, right? Like, so I I'm very friendly with Donnie Chamberlain, who is the kind of the local, she runs a liberal online news outlet that has covered a lot of this stuff. Uh, I'm very friendly with her and I respect her work a lot. But, you know, you can notice over the course of, of the last two years, as things have grown more and more inflamed, Donnie has changed as well. And so like, you'll see on her website now, she calls them the Shas Taliban. And it's just, you know, you get in a real kind of tough situation because if it's like, if your opponents who are to some degree engaging in a democratic process, even if they're opposed to you, if they're the Taliban, and then you're kind of like, you're in this stream of this constant media stream of like just heightening, 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 mm -hmm. then you're going to get in trouble yourself with some of this stuff. And like, it, like, of course, it doesn't get viewed as extremism when a liberal describes their enemy as a Taliban. And I'm not saying that Donnie is obviously not an extremist in any of her views or any of her, even her mode of thinking or reporting, right. but the kind of media environment creates this very like heightened, very like extreme way of talking about everything, right? Everybody's yeah. evil, everybody's out to end democracy, everybody's out to destroy civilization. And that's coming from both sides. And I wish that people could realize that like, they're kind of all just playing Mark Zuckerberg's game. Yeah, absolutely. Everything is screaming. 
Like it has it's it's been screaming since Obama was elected, and then you know when Trump was elected, we got some of the screaming, and now it just continues. But you know we're talking about democratic process, and Reverhe Anselmo, who's a son of one of the founders of Univision, donated money to Patrick Henry Jones's campaign, and Jones won. He was also a big supporter of this recall, even though that was sort of. It's kind of his, his reach was in his uh, effect of that time. But how much are conservative forces outside of Jefferson contributing to the situation? I mean, because, again, it seems like this is very much of interest. You know, making this a success is of great interest to certain conservative interests. You would think that they would be more interested in it, actually. I think revert. Uh, everybody here calls him Reverge. I don't know if that's <laughs> how it's actually pronounced. Um, I think that may be, that may just be how it looks when you read it in the Dunsmere News. But, you know, he's a very isolated case because he moved up here and tried to start a winery and open a chapel, like a religious chapel and like mm. this ranch and all this stuff. And he was basically, he ran into trouble with the county, right? And so somewhere along there, he decided that his problem with permitting with the county government was a question of tyranny, you know? And there is a lot of that. And there is a lot of that kind of thinking, like where, you know, like Carlos Zapata, who's one of the main guys kind of involved in this militia and Carlos Zapata, like he'll get to talking about liberty and stuff, but it, it, it'll go back to stuff where it's like the county wanted to charge him in order to have an amateur rodeo at his house, you know? Right. And that stuff is tough for even conservatives in a kind of national sense to get behind because they don't have that, you know, kind of don't tread on me. I just want to be able to dig a culvert on my land without being bothered. Like right. they don't even see that stuff a lot of the time. The other thing of course, is that a lot of them don't know that this state of Jefferson exists. And so the recall, was a very interesting show of kind of local, what do you want to call it? Local power, but also like a statement by them. And Carlos talks about this, a statement by them that, hey, like we're going to set the tone. We're going to lead a kind of, if you want to call it grassroots, you can call it grassroots. If you want to call it, you know, sinister militia led, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you want to call it, we're going to do this from the ground up as kind of essentially insignificant rural people on the national scene, but then turn this into a model for places across California in the country. And that's already happening. So in mm -hmm. Nevada County, which is, you know, a lot of people will know is having, you know, Truckee in Nevada City, these kind of hipster ski places and stuff like that. Nevada County is having another recall, just like the one here in Chasta County. And people are realizing that, oh man, a lot of our neighbors in the hinterlands of these chic little mountain towns are pretty conservative and pretty angry and you know and you can see traces of this too going across you know people listening to this have probably heard about the greater idaho movement things like that so this is very much i would argue influencing rural politics in other places more so than it is backed by conservatives from afar hmm. and i mean i you know perhaps this comes down to the way of life that the jeffersonians value so much and that the values you know that their most important to them are under threat. So could you, I guess, for sort of our, uh, our city slick and listeners, uh, what, what is what is that lifestyle? And is it actually under threat? Because, it, you know, because again, sort of the example you cite, again, hard to get behind that one. But understanding what it is, and yeah, I will admit, it's a contested part of the narrative. But, but you know, what is in the mix, at least? I'm glad you asked that. Because, you know, the state of Jefferson... Like, I think people from afar might have a lot of trouble understanding how that cultural symbol works, right? So like, you know, as I sit here, sort of just at the very, very north end of Shasta County, you know, Mount Shasta is up just up the road, traditionally liberal. There's a guy across the street from me, or road or whatever you want to call it, uh, who's got a Jefferson flag on his lawn and a resident of state of Jefferson, you know, license plate frame on his Mercedes. You know, that guy is not a militiaman. Uh, he's not even probably right wing. The people in Mount Shasta, a lot of them are going to have state of Jefferson insignia on their cars and stuff. And I always call it kind of like the town of Dunsmere, which is between Reading and Mount Shasta. It's kind of like a 
funny blend of hippies and cowboys. And you can, it's kind of hard to tell the difference sometimes, like the cultural, the cultural break between the kind of pot growing, trailer dwelling, leave me alone hippie is not that different from the kind of like wood cutting, you know, elk hunting redneck trailer dwelling guy. And the Jefferson way of life has always been kind of that. It's this, it's this like live and let live, you know, left-wing people here have guns, uh, left-wing people here haunt, you know, and a lot of right-wing people really don't care in that kind of 50s vision of American conservatism where, you, you know, you're, you're really bothered about what kind of lifestyle your neighbor's living. That has never really been the thing here. And it's always been a kind of, it's been a kind of grouchy, leave me alone attachment to a way of life that is both tied to the land. That's the kind of thing that everybody does genuinely in a very deep way believe. Like people really, they talk about which trees are their favorite at which times when they're pollinating. They talk about the rivers, they talk about the fish, they engage with these things on a really deep level and it really, really matters to them. And a lot of people, whether they're pot growing hippies or some of the people who still work in the sawmills, they derive their actual income. They derive their work from the land. You know, there can be fishing guides, like, but everyone kind of traditionally in the state of Jefferson, and even to this day, they make their money by working in some capacity with nature. And they're really, really attached to that. And I don't personally, and this isn't a political statement, I don't personally see how you can think that that isn't to some degree under it by the simple direction of how neoliberal global society works to these days. And especially as, as logging has gone away, but also unfortunately because of, you know, drought conditions in California and like, you know, even the fishing economy may go away here. And, you know, fly fishing is a big part of people's lives and uh, it's a big part of how people make money up here. And we could see a future in 10 years where that's not a thing anymore. And you know, that stuff, that stuff creates a real worry. And there's another thing that I think is really key and important, which is that when you have a massive, massive transition in how the way, the quality of life that people live based on how much they have to pay for rent, that does affect their way of life in really deep, scary ways. And so, and here two years ago, you know, you could rent a, a nice place for 700 bucks. And now there's nowhere in Dunsmuir nowhere in Mount Shasta to rent for anything less than 1500 bucks. And people are moving away. People are losing their homes. Restaurants are cutting hours because they can't keep workers because workers can't afford to live here. And that's all happening. And I talked to someone from the city of Dunsmuir. I talked to somebody from the city of Dunsmuir yesterday about this. And they did a study and it's happening because of second home buyers. And so there is a very, you, it is actually a very provable thing that their way of life is under attack by transplants from the Bay. And because when, when you have to have really good credit and $1,500 a month in order to be able to get an apartment, that is a system of social control on some right. level because Absolutely. you're not going to be able to do your kind of wood cutting and living out in the woods and doing that stuff. Those guys aren't having apartments. So those guys are moving up to Medford and living. There's a, home, a massive homeless camp south of Medford, Oregon. Massive. And, and like like a true like refugee crisis kind of scene of just people who just you can't find anywhere to live up here and so yeah I mean I, I know I get myself in trouble for saying this but the way of life is very much under attack I don't know that I would say it's under attack by liberals who want to destroy it it's under attack by these kind of like larger unthinking human processes that we're living through in this like age of rapid disruption and I don't think that you know, like forming a militia and getting mad about it is necessarily going to stop it. But you're not, we're not getting any closer to a solution. Like it's not getting better. It's getting much worse. Right. And, I, and the rent increase that you described, that's not just Shasta County. That's the the entire United States. That's happening in cities all over. And and, and again, it is because, as you say, the, the pandemic was this disruptive event and it's had a lot of repercussions that, again, were just sort of starting to wrap our hands around because even though the pandemic feels very long, relatively, that's a short amount of time for that much change. Sure. Yeah. And this area has such a small population and it's so closely linked to like forces and processes 
in both California and the Bay Area, mm -hmm. that it's, I, I would say it's happened, the changes have happened faster here than probably almost anywhere in the country outside of those other places where you had massive influxes of people with a lot of money to spend. Right. Uh, and I think that's different here with the small population and the big money that's coming in. Right. And and again, you know, we keep coming up against this question of how much power communities have versus how much they, they ought to have to determine their own values and their relationship with the state in their ability to, to live it where they live and where that authority ultimately comes from or should come from. And Carlos Zapata, again, love that name, the figurehead of this movement. And he says something really interesting when he connects the revolt that he's leading to that led by his supposed uh, family member, distant relative Salvador Allende, and says that, you know, his family were only socialists because they were revolting against a military government. And w what did that mean to you? Because again, it seems like there is this significant dissatisfaction on the right and the left with how everybody's getting squeezed. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, this is like sort of my, a take that I'm coming around to that uh, is much big and too hot to really go into here, but <laughs> is just that like, in a certain way, like the left right distinctions such as we experience them in America, like we, we, we think of these as like these kind of eternal political divides. That hasn't been true in the United States since, you know, that wasn't true until like the 1960s at the earliest, you know, because mm -hmm. not that long ago, our political parties you know, were coalitions of interests more so than they were ideological constructs, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, somewhere like the state of Jefferson, I think if you told people back then that they were right wing, they would have looked at you like you were crazy. They might have thought they were conservative. But to be on a kind of like right wing side of a grand historical global struggle would have meant absolutely nothing to them. And Basically, I think that that's something that places like this are going to have to get back to, because the interest that someone like the liberal, you know, Donnie Chamberlain, who I mentioned, the interest that she has for a shared future of the county is fundamentally actually not that different than the interest that Zapata has. The problem is that they both think that they're facing world historical enemies across a political chasm, and that those enemies have to be combated before they can work together for that shared political future, right? And so it it's kind of funny and a little like it sounds a little crazy to hear Carlos Zapata like aligning himself as a militiaman in Shasta County with Salvador Allende grand hero <laughs> left but I, I guess I would challenge people to take the spirit seriously right so if your first if your first reaction is to say no that guy's evil how dare he it might be more like well how did we get to a point where he and I think that we're evil yeah. that, that each of the other is evil and that's something that I've experienced a lot here. And it's it's something that, you know, people who read about some of these militia movements from afar often have a lot of trouble grasping. But in between and around the people who are involved in these, you hear a lot of searching. You hear a lot of kind of like these questions, you know, am I on the right path? Or like, I would love to talk to that person. And I don't think they would, but I wish he would. I wish we could just sit down and do this. and you get trained in our kind of current media environment to take that as bullshit, right? But my instinct as reporters actually to take it as more or less genuine because I hear it a lot and because you do hear this kind of like searching emotionality of people wishing that there was some way to not have these political valences shaping everything about how they're going through the world and trying to exercise democratic rights, but they just don't get there, you know? Right. And again, I, I think the first thing that we have to do is really look at the role of social media and all this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and going back to questions of belief, you know, new age belief, I mean, a huge component of this comes from things like QAnon, right? Where it's not just like this side is evil because I disagree with them. It's they're literally evil because they're eating babies <laughs> like Hillary Clinton is sucking the life force out of a baby and again it's like that thing would not exist I'm obviously conspiracy theories have existed for many times blood libel is not a new thing however the the extent to which this has been a successful sort of spread of this belief or a fundamental distrust in 
government bodies and just like I can't reason with them at all comes from the internet and the algorithm and the fact that the more sort of like again I don't want to be judgmental but the sort of the more the more out there things tend to keep people focused and you really lose you lose humanity that way and not simply because you're not looking someone face to face but there are many ways that we're losing each other's humanity and we can't we can't regain it and I think you know just to push back on what I myself just said a little bit like you saw that a lot with the mask stuff coming from the more like right wing people here mm -hmm. that was I didn't, and I didn't honestly notice that so much until I actually moved up here. But there's people just, you know, like young women who work at gas stations, who's been told by their boss to wear a mask and they get, they, you'll hear, they get like berated. They get yeah. people, people get really mad. Like that becomes like a symbol for them. Mm -hmm. And it, they, they don't see like, she probably doesn't want that mask on, man. You know, like they don't see that part. They just see like the enemy. And that has really colored a lot here. It's really kind of, you know, and of course, I'm sure there's people who are driving through here on I-5, you know, from Portland, who you see them all the time. You can always tell who's driving through because they get out and like they go in, they go into the bar or whatever. They're still wearing the mask. And you're like, oh, you haven't been here for a while. Like, and I'm sure that they maybe think that some of these people who are unvaxxed, I mean, Siskiyou County is only 41% vaxxed. Um, I'm sure they think that's evil, you know, but you get a lot of the right wing people who are really in your face about it and it really not, not in super okay ways. And that's something you have to be here for a long time to see the extent of, I think. Yeah. I mean, and again, it's, it's encouraged. There's a, a motive reinforcement for this type of behavior. You know, speaking of that, you know, another sort of growing right wing phenomenon or sort of like a, a strategy is to attend school board meetings and, and, you know, either launch into things about the pandemic, about CRT, different. And again, these are people, these are people who don't even necessarily have children at this particular school, but they will attend the school board meeting and go into this. And this is a very, again, this sounds like a conspiracy, but this is a very coordinated effort on the part of certain conservatives in America to exert their will on the quote unquote, the future of America, right? Have you seen other stuff, like stuff like that? Or is it is it mostly, are schools off limits? <laughs> well, yeah, so I, I mean, that's funny. I, I So I would push back on that a little bit. I mean, in the sense that my experience with this stuff and you know like i you know like i met chris rufo recently and like that he is that's a project that's a project that he's yeah. doing but there's also a real real groundswell and it's not helped by you know one of the things that i've noticed especially in the last two years reporting this story and reporting this other one more about national politics is that the thing that is driving the conservative movement right now is this kind of like they're starting to figure out that the liberal worldview and mode of doing things is going to always be presented as normal. So right. when you get something that's not presented as normal and then you get attacked, they're just going to say, we don't care. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's this very funny thing where if you read liberal media right now, you know, they're like, well, CRT doesn't exist. And conservatives just like no longer care. They're like, okay, call it whatever you want. We're still just going to do our thing. Right. And the schools here are a great example of that because the kids, like big time, big time, the kids started walking out and going on strike against pandemic policies. Um, wow. You didn't even need the parents. Yeah. And it was tough. It was tough for kind of like for observers to write that off because they're like, oh, these kids are being ginned up by their parents. It's like, well, maybe, but you're telling me your 16 year old kid's going to, you know, go into school and do what dad said. So, I mean, the truth is, the truth is, like, especially in these rural schools, like, these kids are radical. These kids are real radical, a lot of them, you know, because they wanted to grow up and be rodeo and do all this stuff. They believe in that stuff. They believe in a lot of this kind of rural, you know, and there's always this kind of thing of like, oh, the young kids on Facebook, they're all like dying the hair blue and doing this stuff. That's true for some people, but a lot of the people in some of these high schools are not like that. A lot of these people in these high schools really embrace the conservative thing. They really embrace the like rural values, rural lifestyles, country music, trucks, ATVs, hunting. That's their thing. And they're like, 
they grew up in an environment where they were getting told all the time, you have to fight for this, you have to fight for this. And that's gonna be a that's gonna be a thing that we see, I think, a lot going forward. I don't want to get too specific on the school stuff because I didn't I didn't like personally report on it, but it was the next phase. There was a, there was a phase where like the recall receded in the news and everything was actually about school walkouts and and stuff going on in these high schools here. And that was a big, you know, that was a big moment, I think, in the terms of the county being like, oh wow, like something's shifting here that's not going to be easily put back in the bottle. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to go back to somebody like Eamon Bundy, right? Who, like I said, kind of kicked off this this new form of kind of conservative pushback, let's say. And, and there are people who, like January 6th, wouldn't have happened without Eamon. Like there's a lot of different, there. The, you know, there's been this sort of crescendoing of how conservative People express their displeasure with the government or individuals, et cetera. You cannot see the future. However, when you're talking about these kids, it's hard not to think like there's only one way this is going to go unless there's some something to push back on it. It has to be a meaningful thing to 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 push back on it or otherwise it's only going to get more extreme. Yeah. I mean, I think. Like you could have, there's like some version of the world in which like a Ron DeSantis figure gets elected and like manages to just kind of put a lid on things for a minute by, you know, like passing a bunch of bills that kind of like look like they're doing something there. I mean, you, well, so here's the problem, right? And, and I'm going to quote Curtis Yarvin because I've been reporting on him, but it's, it, it's an interesting critique. He's like, well, a lot of this conservative activism that's working is bound to just lead to more trials and anger and disappointment and rage because you can get rid of CRT in schools or something, but you can't bring back your, you know, family values, Christian mom and apple pie society. So you can resurrect the epiphenomenon of a long dead society, but you can't re resurrect the phenomenon of the society itself, right? And that is something that I'm going to now connect to the state of Jefferson because I think it's true. Like, what could you possibly do at this point where you can say, okay, we're going to pass a bunch of bills and say we're going to get rid of, you know, mask mandates here. They're gone anyway. It doesn't matter. We're going to do a vote in the county that says that we we support the Second Amendment. That's a big thing they want to do. And, and to do open carry here, even though open carry is illegal in California, they want to get a sheriff in here who will allow open carry. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that, right? But that's not bringing anything back because what's changed is that, you know, the logging economy has gone away, that the family ties and the binds are gone away, that people mm -hmm. had to move in order to find jobs, like that you people outside of here don't, you know, th 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 this whole region has sort of started to lose the character of living off the land that people always wanted. Mm -hmm. You can't bring that back by doing these kind of epiphenomenon laws, to use a really complicated phrase. And in a national sense, you know, you could have one of these Ron DeSantis guys who come in and kind of kind of make a big show doing stuff. But the actual kind of desire for a like a non-globalized America that has like a, you know, that retains family values and isn't constantly swept by new cultural phenomena and stuff like that. There's no president that can do that, right? That's right. why a lot of these guys want a dictator. And I think the honest likelihood is, yeah, you're not, you're going to have a win or die struggle at some point. You're getting, one side has to win this. And the likelihood, I think, is probably that like liberal globalized consumer society will win out over a motley collection of like conservatives who can't even really agree on what they want. And I think that's probably the future that most sane Americans are going to have to bet on anyway and want for. But in terms of like, what is going to happen to this kind of like militia fringe that won't accept it at any cost, I'm having a lot of trouble figuring out how it ends anywhere other than they actually do take real authoritarian power or they go to jail. That's, it seems like that's where we're coming. And it seems like that's what they talk about. They say like, we're either gonna win or we're just gonna be blood in the streets. You know, that, that's, these are the quotes that are coming from them. And I'm in the same way that I'm the kind of reporter who will take them at face value when they say they wish that they could have these more intimate conversations and bridge the political divides. 
I also take them at face value when they say they're willing to die because I've seen it and I saw it, you know, I saw it in 2016 with Ammon. And when I talk to Carlos, I think he's serious. And so this is a long way of saying that this recall election is a great example of the fear that I personally have, which is that you get these people who are like, we're willing to die unless we can get some kind of like democratic political power. And then they get democratic political power. And the liberals still, still say, no, this is illegitimate. We're gonna fight you tooth and nail. And the only things they can actually do are these very small symbolic things. So then what? Mm. And I don't have an answer to that, but it worries me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Have there been any new developments in Shasta County since this story went to press? I mean, obviously it sounds like a lot's going on, but... <laughs> As far as the actual politics, the, the thing to realize is that, you know, all that we have here are three relatively moderate board members of a county board who are now themselves about to be beset by their radical followers asking why they can't do things. And that's going to be pretty tough. And it may end up that some of this coalition doesn't hold together. And so we're going to see about that. But I, at the moment, I'm kind of, I'm heading up to Siskiyou County, which I'll just tell your listeners because I think it might be interesting. You know, Siskiyou County is a place beset by like really, really serious drought problems. And a lot of people's wells went dry last summer. And this year is going to be worse because the, the, there's really not a lot of water in Mount Shasta. And there's not a lot of water in these reservoirs. And so the conflict between ranching water users and native tribes is going to bring a lot of these militia people to a point of real, real stress. Because, you know, Mark Baird, the kind of main head of the state of Jefferson secessionist organization, is himself a rancher. And he was talking about going to war last year. This year is going to be worse. And this year is going to be worse for fires. It's going to be hotter. Uh, and it's going to color people's, you know, that colors people's worldviews and makes them angry. And so I think it's going to be a really wild and in some ways, maybe even scary summer up in here in the north of California, but we will see. Yeah, I guess the state of Jefferson, part of the initial push to secede was a, a, a big PR coup. And it was it was partially funded by this completely uh, fabulous journalist. Uh, and in the piece, you note that a lot of media reports about the state of Jefferson kind of oversimplify or misunderstand the situation. And my question to you is that, you know, you live there. So why did you why did you wait until sort of like the last part of the piece to disclose that fact? Just I'm out of out of curiosity. And again, not 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 to say you're pushing some agenda. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, no, I actually there's a very simple reason for that. It's that the place late in the piece where I reveal that I lived there is actually chronologically when I moved up here. So mm -hmm. I actually moved up here really recently. I've been coming here for ten years and. I, during most of the pandemic, I was living, you know, like a lot of people during the pandemic, I kind of lived around, right? So I was like in LA, my girlfriend's family had a house in the Bay, and then I was up here. So it kind of felt like I already lived here, but like I kind of moved here with a fellowship and with a plan to write a book, like just a few months ago. And so I basically just got up here and took a little like short-term rental that was very not nice because it is really, really, really hard to find places to rent up here right now. But I found this place that my girlfriend and I called the hovel. And even with the difficulty in renting, I just kind of realized like, oh yeah, this works for me. This, this is right. And, you know, I'm on the Sacramento river and it's a town of 240 people. And, you know, it's just nothing it's nothing like what <laughs> when I was 23 and fact checking at GQ magazine and beginning my career in magazines. Uh, it's not precisely where I thought my life would end up, but it's <laughs> kind of just, it's all been trending this way in certain ways. I just, this is the stuff I like. And these are the conversations I like and reporting out here on the woods and stuff is pretty fun. So hopefully it works out after the fellowship ends. I'm really going to have to sell a book on this in order to, to fund <laughs> the incredibly expensive way of life up here. Cause it's $6 gas and rent more expensive than in LA. Um, Shit. But yeah, it's really crazy. But for now it's working. All right. Well, I hope it continues to work. I hope that gas price goes down. 
Thank you so much. This was really excellent. This was awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank for your you. great questions. Appreciate yeah. it. You've been listening to the Harper's Podcast, produced by Violet Luca and Andrew Blevins. The music is Cut and Shoot by Febrifuge. The New York Times called Harper's America's Most Interesting Magazine. Receive elegant, insightful, and wry writing from the best journalists, essayists, critics, novelists, and poets every month in our print magazine, and gain access to our digital archive, which stretches back to 1850. Visit harpers.org slash save to subscribe for only $16.97.